good evening we will be starting the last technical session now so this has three talks of 30 minutes each and the titles sound very interesting so i i have the privilege to at least read the titles one is first talk is by shobhana it is the clearness of the object elements of style in scientific writing and she said it's inspired by tony's uh, writings and second talk is for whom the bell tolls non locality and randomness by professor home and the third one is by our urbasi sinha and she talks about two is a company but three need not be a crowd so a, every title sounds very different so i request uh, shobhana to give so let me first explain where the title of this talk comes from so uh, already in the 17th century robert boyle the boyle of boyle's law talked about how scientific writing should be and he wrote though it were foolish to color or enamel upon the glasses of telescopes yet to gild or otherwise embellish the tubes of them may render them more acceptable to the users without at all lessening the clearness of the object to be looked at through them so he said obviously the important thing is that the object should be clear so you should not obscure the clearness of the object but you might somehow make the experience more beautiful and this i think is the fundamental uh premise of scientific writing it should be clear but you can try to do it nicely and the second part of my title comes from this famous book elements of style it's one of the fam most famous books about writing and uh it's not about scientific writing it's just about writing and what is style style is something very hard to define but we all have this idea about what style is so there's a sentence i took from it which i like very much it says who can confidently say what ignites a certain combination of words causing them to explode in the mind and who knows why certain notes in music are capable of stirring the listener though the same notes slightly rearranged are impotent and it's the same with words certain words in a certain order sound beautiful but you rearrange them and they don't sound so beautiful and these are high mysteries so i want to discuss these high mysteries in this talk which is obviously a rather ambitious goal and why am i doing it at this conference it's because of this paper which professor legget talked about yesterday he mentioned it uh he wrote this paper in 1966 i think though it has been republished in various places several times since then and he said also yesterday that he thinks surprisingly that it might be his most impactful paper and though it says it is for japanese physicists i think it is very interesting for all of us to read so if you haven't already read it do i urge you to go read it um it's uh, the pdf is available for free on the web and uh, i also think it's quite remarkable that it was uh, written by someone who at that time was only 28 it shows a remarkable maturity if i may be allowed to say that uh so i boldly said i would give this talk and then when i actually started to think about it i began to get very nervous because it's one thing to tell an audience of students uh how to write a paper but this audience is obviously a very different audience everybody here uh obviously feels they know how to write papers and what am i going to discuss with them so then i thought i had a brilliant idea i would just give you a lot of alternatives and make you vote on them do you like this better or do you like that better and maybe you will tell me how to write a paper so i was very happy with that solution till i went back and read professor legget's paper and i saw this sentence there it says that asian authors have a strong tendency to avoid too definite or assertive a statement possibly because it is thought presumptuous to impose one's views this was obviously what was prompting me to have this format 
without conceding that they're plausible alternatives. And it said, if you state your opinion vaguely because you want to leave room for various possible interpretations besides your own, they will often simply take this as a sign of vague or muddled thinking. Now, I don't want you to think of me that I'm a vague or muddled thinker. So therefore, try to be as definite, as assertive as possible, even if it feels a little unnatural. Now, there are multiple reasons why it feels unnatural to me. We can discuss this later over dinner if you like. So I'm a little bit torn about the format of this talk, but it's meant to be a participatory talk. So the average paper, it says, this is a quote from Francis Crick. It says, there's no form of prose more difficult to understand and more tedious to read than the average scientific paper. <laughs> so I'm going to discuss, can we change this? So I'm going, I've divided my talk into two parts. I don't know how much I can get through in 25 minutes. So the first part is structure. And this is an advisor talking to a student and saying, no, no, if you make the paper too easy to read, everyone will know how you got the results. And I have to say, I feel there's some truth in this because I work so hard to make my papers lucid and transparent. And then the referees always say, everything in this paper is obvious. And then they reject the paper. So I do tell my students now, maybe we shouldn't make it so clear. Maybe we should put in a little mumbo jumbo. I mean, I said tongue in cheek, but there's some truth in this, I think. So how do you structure a paper? I find that students, when they first start writing a paper, they want to structure it in a chronological way because they think of the order in which they did it. They carried out the research, so they want to say, first this happened, then this happened, then this happened, finally this happened. But I guess most of us would agree that the better way to structure it is a logical order. First this, therefore this, therefore this, and finally this. And the two need not be the same at all. OK? And the logical order is not at all obvious. You may think it's obvious, but sometimes it's not obvious at all. And it may not. Um, so that's why I've given you this exercise on this paper. So there are four pictures. There's a dog sitting in a chair. There's a dog barking and a cat running away. There's a man shouting and a dog running away. And there's a dog looking at a cat. So I want you all to arrange these in what you think is a logical order, which tells some story. If you want, you can tear the paper into four pieces and arrange it. And I want you to know that I have done this exercise before, and there is no unique answer. Different people have different stories, so please do this quickly. Huh? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Get. OK. There is no obvious choice. That is the whole message of this. OK. So did anyone think A, B, C, D? No. Did anyone think A, C, D, B? No. I'm a bit surprised by that. No one thought ACDB, really? OK, I'll sh OK, did anyone think DBAC? Did anyone think BACD? None of the above? People are cheating. They're not doing the work. There are people who have not answered anything. This is not allowed in this lecture. You're going to have to do a lot of work. OK, so this is the one that most people, I think, have answered. The dog, the cat, is yelling at the cat, and it, the cat runs away. And then the dog sits. And then the dog is yelled at. So the message of this could be like bullies will be bullied in their turn. OK? How many people thought this was the logical? OK, a lot of people. 
how about this one? The dog is sitting, the man yells at it, and then when the cat sits, the dog yells. And this one is exactly the reverse of the previous one. And this one is why evil is perpetuated in the world. If someone is mean to you, then you learn to be mean to other people. Yes? Is that a logical sequence? No, I don't agree. <laughs> yes. It is a sequence. Yes. No, you. No, with mother-in-law perhaps, but this can happen. You can learn very fast. No, but there's a missing event in between. What is the missing event? What is the? Cat coming, the man getting off, and the cat coming. Yes, but it's still a logical sequence. Okay, now here is the third one. Okay, the dog yells at the cat, then the dog sits, and then the dog is yelled at, and then the cat, the dog learns how it felt to be yelled at. So the next time it sees the cat, it just sits and looks at it. Huh? So this, uh, it says, I used to be mean to others until someone was mean to me. So it's exactly the opposite message of the previous one. Okay, so what did I want to show you with this exercise is that if you have the same objects, you can play with them and try to, uh, you can argue about what the logical sequence should be. But the point is that there is an exercise to be done of what the logical sequence should be. Okay, and then once you have the logical sequence that you feel is logical, how should you present it? So, say you want to say this happened, then this happened, then this happened, or maybe it's a logical sequence. You can play with it when you present it. Okay, so I'm telling you the end here. What is the end? He's in jail. So, what do you think? What occurs to you when you see this? Yeah, what's the question in your mind? What did he do? Okay, so I'm telelling you the beginning. <laughs> it's a story anyway. Yeah, I'm not telling you this is the story. It's a story. It's a story. Okay, so here's a story. And then this. And then this. What's going to happen next, do you think? OK. So then this. And then this. OK. So the question I have for you is whether you think playing with the chronological sequence by making use of the flashback made the story more interesting. Was it better to show you the jail at the end? Or would it have been better to just tell it in chronological order and tell you at the end that the jail came. So who liked it better the way I showed it? And who thinks it's better to keep you in suspense and tell you the jail at the end? Nobody. Again, people are not putting up their hand for anything. This is not OK. Nobody thinks it's better to tell you the end. Some people. OK, can you do this in a scientific paper? Can you play with the sequence? Yes, no? Yes, well, of course, there's the abstract. But there's also, for example, here, this is two versions of a paper I wrote on topological insulators, where we were trying to see whether we could make a topological insulator by taking a material and stretching it by applying chemical pressure. And in the first version, in the introduction, we wrote, our main goal in this paper is to test whether applying chemical pressure by functionalization induces a topological transition. And only at the end did we say we found it, at the end of the paper. And then my co-author said, no, no, I don't like this way of doing it. He changed it to, below we show that chemical substitutions impose giant strains on the lattice, yet preserve structural stability. Importantly, they result in a topological insulating phase at ambient conditions. So right at the beginning, you give away your main result. 
I'm told this is also called the American style, where in a talk or in a paper, you give your main result right at the beginning of the paper. So how many of you like the first style better? And how many of you like the second style better? OK, so again, here I think it's 50-50. Some people like the other style, and some people like the American style. You like both. So which would you write? <laughs> to a British journal or an American journal? Huh. And then the proof, yes. Do you know the results? Yes, yes, of course. Dependent on the participants? Yeah, I agree completely. And in biology papers, the title gives the result. The title is a statement that gives your main result, whereas in physics, that is generally considered uh, unacceptable. So it's also field dependent. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that readers. might be a reason to do B. Yeah, readers don't read yeah. They just look at it. OK. So now, what I've done so far is I've talked about the sequence as if it is just one straight line running through. But if you think about our work, it isn't like that at all. Our work is much more like this. You start here, you try something, it doesn't work. You try something, it doesn't work. You try, it doesn't work. And then maybe something works, and something works, and something works. So should you just tell, you forget all this, and you tell one straight story? Or should you try to tell some of the branches? You what? Both. One to physical review letters, and others to physical review letters. <laughs> <laughs> so Yes, that's all, uh, of course a dilemma. And then if you have an accidental discovery, do you pretend that you were trying to look for that all the time? Or do you reveal that it was an accidental discovery? <coughs> and so this comes into the structure of how you structure it. And now I return to Professor Leggett. And this is something which I'm told is called the Leggett tree and has become very famous. So in his paper, if this is the direction of reading, he said that Japanese authors often structure their paper like this. Okay, So many, many streams of thought come and coalesce here. And he said, you shouldn't do this. You should instead have one line running through and maybe a few branches going off. And I also think it's quite important to notice that at the end, you have just one point. I think it's quite important that a paper have one main message rather than many messages. Now, you might think that this is an obvious thing, but I want to tell you a story about a student of mine. So I asked her to just work out first the structure for her paper. And I said, write it in point form and give it to me. Just give bulleted points. And she returned with 46 pages of latex bulleted points. And I said, what is this? 46 pages. What are you doing? I'm supposed to expand from this, not condense from this. And then when I looked at the structure of her paper, I realized it was like this, her structure. So to give you an analogy, I would, maybe I was a bit mean to her, but I told her, I felt she had told me the story of the Ramayana in this fashion. She said, Rama did this, 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 to the end of the story. And then Sita did this, Sita did this, Sita did this, Sita did this, Sita did this. And then Lakshmana did this, Lakshmana did this, Lakshmana did this. And right at the end, she said, oh, by the way, Rama and Sita were married, and Lakshmana was Rama's brother. That was the way she structured the paper, which obviously didn't work. So this was the structure of the paper. So you have to work on the structure of the paper first. So what message do I want to leave you with this? I took this from Elements of Style by Strunk and White. So you have to first choose a design. That's quite important. And I think the important word here is that you have to choose it. You have a choice of design, and you have to choose which design. Okay. 
And now for language, this is again from PhD comics. This guy is saying that's an interesting question, certainly precise determination of cur current temporal status of utmost practical importance. While it is not possible to provide definite answers within the present context, future work will. And she says, you mean you don't know the time. So he said all that instead of just saying, I don't know what the time is. And this is obviously something we have to work on in language. So before going to language, I'm going to make you vote on a few things. And this time, I want every single person really to vote. So I'm going to talk about style. OK, so first I'm going to show you two pictures. And you have to say which style appeals to you more. So does A, who likes A better? Who likes B better? OK, so here, obviously, there are no right answers and wrong answers. But overwhelmingly, most of you liked A better, but some people liked B better. I also saw a gender breakup here, which was interesting. <laughs> also, OK. Now comes something that's a little different. Here's art. They're both pictures of polar bears. Obviously very different in style. Who likes A better? Who likes B better? Now I see about a 50-50 breakup. OK, so it's clear that as opposed to fashion, when it comes to art, it's much more divided. Some people like the detail and the realism. And some people like it boiled down to its essential concepts. OK, so now let's come to language. I'll show you two sentences. One says, all that glitters is not gold. And one says, it is not necessary that every object that coruscates be fashioned from the aureate metal. Who likes A better? Who likes B better? Sumati, I don't believe you. You're lying to me. <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> OK, so it's clear here, despite what Sumati likes to pretend, that everybody likes the simple language better. OK? So here I have another sentence. It's just one sentence. It's the first sentence of a novel. It says, India, which hangs like a wet washcloth from the towel rack of Asia, presented itself to Tex as he landed in Delhi, or was it Bombay, as if it mattered, because Tex finally had an idea to make his mark and fortune. And that idea was a chain of steakhouses to serve the millions. And he wondered as he deplaned down the steep, shiny steel steps why no one had thought of it before. OK, so how many people like this sentence? OK. Some people like it. How many don't like it? So Professor Leggett, can I ask you why you like it? <laughs> OK. And the people who don't like it, why don't you like it? OK, Professor Leggett, do you want to dispute her contention? <laughs> She's saying there's unnecessary information in the sentence. Do you think it should have been broken up into yeah, more sense yeah. and yeah. smaller sentences? OK. Yeah. OK, so there's clearly some dispute here. OK. Yeah, but it's fiction, so it's not necessary to like. OK, so here's another sentence, which is a first sentence of a novel. I told the boys to stay quiet while I went to fetch my gun. How many like this? How many don't like it? You don't like it. How many don't like it? 
No, okay, so the people who like it, why don't you like? Uh, why do you like it? Does it make you want to read further? No, it creates a mood. Okay. Okay. Here's the first sentence of a scientific paper. Now, uh, most of us are not in this field, so that sort of biases it. But it says, given the aspects of subunit heterogeneity, the dimerization and DNA binding roles, the control of transcription of AP1 subunit genes, the time course of subunit synthesis as well as degradation and the regulation of their function become important issues for an evolution of the effect of target gene expression and on cellular behavior. How many like this sentence? Okay, Professor Baskaran, why do you like this? It says many things in a very complex way. Okay. It's a connection. Okay. How many, okay, the people who don't like it, why don't you like it? Some what character? Too descriptive. Okay. I feel it violates one of the rules that Professor Leggett laid down. He said a sentence should ideally have 20 or fewer words, and this has 60 words. You've forgotten the beginning. Yeah. It's just one sentence. You cannot make any impression yeah. on you at the end of the book because you cannot learn anything. Yeah, okay, you sorry. Can't you can't you can't and that's the same okay, so now here, this is supposing you're Watson and Crick writing your paper on the DNA structure. I've given you three per sentences. The structure of deoxyribose nucleic acid has been a topic of great interest for many years. This is the standard first sentence, which like 90% of scientific papers start this way. The second one is we wish to su suggest a structure for the salt of DNA. And then the third one is DNA is possibly the most important biological molecule holding the secret to life and its replication. How many like A? Only Chandan. So there's always just one person who likes something. How many like B? And how many like C? Okay. So B is what Watson and Crick used. It is certainly a non-standard use. It's a slightly quirky usage. Uh, we wish to suggest it's perhaps uh, not very acceptable, but they got away with it, and that's what they did. They just suggested it. They had no proof for it. I like C also, except that for this holding the secrets to life is a little bit over the top, perhaps. Yeah, so that's not quite acceptable. So I would tend to agree B or C. I don't like A because I think it is really boring and nearly every sentence, I mean, I went through many papers looking for first sentences and 95% of the papers I looked at had a sentence like A. I will tell you, the C I would like, be happy if I'm giving a public talk on the Yeah. But not uh, when I like it. Okay, so I'll just have two more examples and then I'll finish. Okay, so this, okay, maybe I'll skip this because we're over time. I'll just ask you this one. This is for a popular talk. It says, first thing that happens when you have a heart attack, an unlucky part of your heart turns white. How many like this sentence? How many don't like this sentence? Okay, why do you like it, somebody who likes it? Okay. Okay. Somebody who doesn't like it, why don't you like it? Yeah. It says nothing. So. So for me, the thing that bothers me about this is this word unlucky. It really bothers me because I mean it's sort of cool, but it's also very unscientific to me. That, that's the set word that bothers me. It, yeah, it's popular science, I know. Certainly in scientific paper, it would be absolutely unacceptable. But even in popular science, to me, it sort of bothers me. Okay, I think my time's up, so I'll stop. I have to leave you with a message uh, to be uh, firm and assertive, etc. 
So the message I chose from uh, elements of style is omit needless words. That is succinct. You want to say something, yeah. And the key thing here is obviously needless, and it's hard to decide needless. So that's the tricky part. Thank you. And I'll leave you with this cartoon. <laughs> So thanks for a very interesting talk. So there are many questions, maybe, but we have to start the next. Huh. Huh. So this is the year, uh, I think about eight years back, huh. three best worst constructed sentences were given awards. And the one which won the award went from Yale to Harvard. OK, so you know where I did my PhD, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I just make um, one um, comment. I, I'm sure other people would be, be better able to, to uh, say whether this is right or not. But I suspect that um, some, some of the um, observations um, including my own <laughs> that you quoted, are uh, specifically English. If you were to, say, be writing in German, I suspect some of the outcome would be different. Yeah, I think that's true. But nowadays, I think overwhelmingly scientific writing is done only in English. I mean, people have almost stopped publishing in other languages, I think. I don't know if that's good or bad, but would you agree about that? <laughs> Yeah, maybe.